1 Samuel chapter 30, and uh, we are only two chapters away from the end of 1 Samuel. But uh, I got to tell you, I can't end our series on the life of David with the death of Saul. <laughs> so uh, I believe the Lord will have us to go at least five chapters into 2 Samuel. And uh, if we go a little longer than that, we'd only go to chapter 9. But um, <clears throat> save the rest of it for another day. But I don't want to end with David not king yet and Saul just having died and say, that was our series on the life of David. <laughs> so anyways, <laughs> but uh, tonight we're in 1 Samuel chapter 30. <clears throat> Plus, I'm enjoying the series, so. If I wasn't enjoying it, I'd say, let's take a break. But I'm enjoying the life of David, so it's, it's good to keep going a little bit. Let's stand for the reading of God's word, 1 Samuel chapter 30. And we'll read the whole chapter. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captive that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the six hundred men that were with him, and came to the brook Bezor, and where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and four hundred men, for two hundred abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. And they found an Egyptian in the field, and they brought him to David, and gave him bread, and he did eat. And they made him drink water, and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, to whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me because, because three days ago, agone, I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Carathites, and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said unto him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day, and there escaped not a man of them, save four hundred young men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away and rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, This is David's spoil. And David came to the two hundred men which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. 
Then answered all the wicked men and men of Belial of those that went with David and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. And said David, You shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall apart alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. And when David came to Ziklag, he sent of the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord, to them which were in Bethel, and to them which were in South Ramoth, and to them which were in Jatir, and to them which were in Aroer, and to them which were in Shifmoth, and to them which were in Eshtemoa, and to them which were in Rachel, and to them which were in the cities of the Jeremielites, and to them which were in the cities of the Kenites, and to them which were in Horma, and to them which were in Koreshin, and to them which were in Athak, and to them which were in Hebron, and to all the places where David himself and his men were wont to haunt. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this time we've had, in your, that for this passage of scripture that we're considering this evening. Lord, we're so thankful for the life of David, and Lord, so, uh, so encouraging to see him in this chapter as he's encouraging himself in the Lord. And we're so thankful, Lord, for the difference you made in his life, Lord, when he turned himself to you. And I pray, Lord, that each one of us will, uh, no matter what our situation, I pray that we'll look to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. Chippy the parakeet never saw it coming. One second he was peacefully perched in his cage, the next, he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. It all happened when Chippy's owner decided to clean, the, ch clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in the cage, and the next thing she knew, the phone rang. She turned to answer the phone, and then all of a sudden she had barely said hello when Chippy got sucked in. <laughs> and uh, the bird owner gasped. She put down the phone. She turned off the vacuum. Opened the bag, there was Chippy still alive, but uh, a little stunned. And uh, <clears throat> the bird, uh, since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she grabbed him and raced to the bathroom and turned on the faucet and held Chippy under the running water. I'm just laughing, sorry. She held Chippy under the running water, and uh, realizing that Chippy was soaked and shivering, uh, she, just, she did what any compassionate bird owner would do, and she reached for the hairdryer and uh, blasted the pet with hot air. And uh, poor Chippy never knew what hit him, really. And uh, <clears throat> a few days after the trauma, there was a reporter that actually wrote about this event and contacted Chippy's owner to see how the bird was recovering. And she replied, well, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits and stares. <laughs> yeah. Not, see, not hard to see why. Sucked in, washed up, and blown over. <laughs> That's enough to steal the song from the bravest heart. You know, um, it's a little funny, but uh, with all seriousness, sometimes life has a way of stealing our song, doesn't it? We can relate to Chippy and uh, be have go, go and have a time when it's hard to sing, and uh, things don't always go the way that we plan. What do you do in those situations? What do you do when life comes at you? Well, in this evening, as we look at 1 Samuel chapter 30, you know who's kind of like the parakeet? David. <laughs> at the beginning of this chapter, everything is going wrong. He gets back from the army of the Philistines. That wasn't his best day when the Philistines decided they didn't want him part of their army. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a good day. Anyways, but the Philistines kicked him out of their army, sent him back home, and uh, he gets home to find that the city that he lives in is burned with fire. His wives have been taken captive. All his men's wives and sons and daughters have been taken captive by the Amalekites. And uh, the, the, on top of it all, his men, his 600 men, his mighty men, 
are all conspiring against him, wanting to stone him. He's having a bad day. He's at his lowest point. It says in verse 4 that David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. They had a, he was having a bad day. What do you do? What do you do when things aren't going right? Well, look at what David does in verse 6. It says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. That's what you do. You find encouragement in the Lord. Encourage yourself in God. This evening as we look at this chapter, that's the truth that the Lord's impressed upon my heart. That no matter what our situation, what the trial, what the trouble, we can always look to the Lord and find encouragement in him. Regarding this, C.H. McIntosh writes, there is no condition in which the Christian can find himself in, in which he may not count upon God. Is he crushed beneath the pressure of trial from external circumstances? Let him bring God's omnipotent power to bear upon these things. Is the heart oppressed by the burden of personal infirmity? Truly a heavy burden. Let him draw upon the exhaustless springs of divine compassion and mercy. Is the soul filled with horror by the sense of sin and guilt? Let him have recourse to the boundless grace of God and the infinitely precious blood of Christ. In word, whatever be the burden, the trial, the sorrow, or the need, God is more than equal to all, and it is the province of faith to use him. Whatever your situation, you can look to the Lord. David's at what we call wit's end. His family's been taken hostage, his home's burned, his friends are muted against him. But in his darkest hour, he turns to the Lord. And this evening, as we look at this chapter, we see what he finds when he encouraged himself in the Lord. Number one, what did he find? Number one, when we encourage ourselves in the Lord, we find his mercy. We find his mercy. I say that we find his mercy at the very beginning because this isn't always the case. But in David's situation, who was to blame for all of this? This was David. David's his men were turned against him, and I kind of think, well, yeah, you brought them to the army of the Philistines, and now God has chastened him. God's chastened him and allowing these, these, Philist- these Amalekites to take his family captive. But even in all of that, God's still gracious and full of compassion. God's still merciful, because <clears throat> after all, Yes, they took them captive, but notice it says in verse 2, they slew not any, either great or small. Yes, God was purposing to chasten David, but he wasn't purposing to destroy him. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because they are new every morning. His compassions, they fail not. Great is thy faithfulness. And in this text, we see David finding God's mercy. Two different things here to see in verses 7 and 8. We kind of looked at verses 1 to 6 last week. Verse 7 and 8, we see, first of all, that God answered his prayer. He answered his prayer. Here it is in verse 7, when David finally asks for that ephod. Verse 7, and David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. Remember, the ephod was what the priests had where they were to inquire of the Lord at and different theories as to how it worked, but there were, I believe it was like a black stone that would glow if the answer was yes or different things. And anyways, David's inquiring of the Lord. This is the first time we read that in the last 16 months that David's asking the Lord, what should I do? And, uh, You know, God hadn't answered Saul's prayer. 
Remember in chapter 28, God didn't answer him by prophets or by dreams or by Urim and Thummim. God hadn't answered him because Saul hadn't prepared his heart to seek the Lord. But here he's answering David's prayer. David, even though he's been out of fellowship with God for his last little while, he's been living with the Philistines, lying and marching with the Philistine army. As soon as he turns to God, God's there. Draw nigh to God, and God will draw nigh to you. And uh, you might read this account, and you think, this is very funny to me, that David would even ask whether or not he should go. I mean, you get back, and you find that your wife's been kidnapped. <laughs> Don't you just go? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> do you really need to pray about that one, David? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> put yourself in this situation. If that was you... You'd be after that guy so fast, you wouldn't know what hit him. I mean, you wouldn't let that kind of thing stand. But I'm reminded here that no matter what it is, even when we know it's the most obvious thing, we still need to talk to the Lord about it. We still need to trust the Lord in all our heart and lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And I think David... He's learned his lesson. That's why he's asking the Lord. Because that's how he got here in the first place, was he didn't ask the Lord. He got it in the first place because he tried to do it on, him, on his own. He tried to, he said, this is what I need to do to keep myself and my family safe. I'm going to go down to Achish, and he's going to protect me, and this is my plan. And his plan failed. His plan didn't work. He had gone his way, and now in Ziklag, he's lost his, he's lost his wives. They've been taken captive by the Amalekites. Back when he was in the promised land, trusting the Lord, that never happened to him. Yes, he had to hide from Saul, but God, it was a wall of fire around him. He was always safe. And so he's learned his lesson now, and he's going to not take a step forward without first asking the Lord what he should do. And so he's asked the Lord, and God answers his prayer. But also I see in the text that God shows his mercy by assuring him his path. He assured his path. Just mean that God promised him that this was going to work out. Um, you see in verse 8, when David inquires of the Lord, he says, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? This is one of the reasons he prayed. He wasn't just asking God if he should. He was asking God, will you, will you make sure this works out? Will you make sure that I'm victorious? Will I overtake them? Will I get them back? Will you help me to restore what I've lost? Will you be pleased to help me in this situation? And, you know, we, we wonder why he sought counsel. But remember how foolish it would have been to do it without the Lord's help. How foolish it would have been to go up and fight against those Amalekites without being assured that the Lord was on his side. And so God in his mercy answers his prayer and assures his path. You notice God didn't just answer him and say, yes, you'll overtake them. He added something. It says, and he answered him, pursue for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. God assured him of his path. And as Christians, Aren't we glad that God assures us of, of, of our path? He assures us of where we're going, where he's leading us. David knew before he ever starts on this journey to take back what was lost, he knows how it's going to end. He knows that he's going to recover all. He doesn't know what's going to happen next. He doesn't know that 200 of his men are going to get so weary they have to be left behind. He doesn't know where the Amalekite camp is and how exactly he's going to get to them and how he's going to find all. He doesn't know all the details, but he knows the ending. He knows that he will recover all. God's assured him of it. And so he goes forward looking uh, to recover what was lost. And that's how it is for us. That's the Christian life. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what the different trials are going to be. We don't know necessarily all the details of the future when it comes to our personal lives. But we know where it's leading. We know that God is working all things together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We know that God has an eternal plan for us. 
that he's working out. And one day we're going to see it all come to pass. And so he's given us assurance, assurance for our pathway, assurance for the future. And it's the mercy of God that gives us that. So number one, when we encourage ourselves in the Lord, we find his mercy. And secondly, when we encourage ourselves in the Lord, I didn't alliterate today. We find his provision. We find his provision. If you can think of a word that starts with the letter M, by all means, put it in there. But I'm not promising it's going to be as easy next time. (laughs) But we find his provision. In verses 9 to 15, we read how David and 600 of his men at the beginning make their, these men that at the beginning were going to stone him, these men that were so fed up with David that they were against him, God has turned their hearts to follow him. And now they're going to go march after these Amalekites and think of how God helped them for the journey. Number one, or big letter A, he gave them strength. You say, well, verses 9 and 10 don't really tell you that. (laughs) So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. Those 200 men, they had to stay behind. They were tired. Ever realized that? David and his 400 men, they had every reason to be tired too. I mean, they had just come back from a three-day march from the Philistines. They had just, uh, they, they had come and they had wept until they had no more power to weep. They were, at, they were at their wits end. They had nothing left in the tank. And then they pray and God says, go after them. And they leave right away. No time to rest, no time to fuel. Where do you get the strength to go after those enemies? Well, that's where the Lord comes in. That's where the Lord gave them the strength. We don't notice it because we notice the 200 that had to take a rest at the brook. But 400 of them went on. And it was because the strength from above. God gave them the strength for the battle. And it speaks to us of when we encourage ourselves in the Lord, that's where we find strength. The Bible says, and it was testified Sunday morning, Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. David encouraged himself in the Lord and found God's strength. He gave them strength, but also he gave them the sight in that he brought them to the place. How are they ever going to find these Amalekites? They didn't know what way they went. They knew maybe where, they, where their land was, but they didn't know what direction they had gone or where they were camping. But in verses 11 to 15, God gives them a guide. God gives them someone on the inside who brings them right to them. Verse 11, And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread, and he did eat. And they made him drink water. And they gave him a piece of cake of, of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him. For he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? <coughs> and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. My master left me because three days agone I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Carathites and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. This man gives them the location, brings them right to the site. Um, Just before we even talk about that, though, Do you realize what this is a picture of in these verses with this Egyptian that they found ready to die? This is a beautiful picture of our salvation, isn't it? This guy here, he's an Egyptian. That's a picture of the world. Egypt is a picture of the world. That's where his citizenship was. He was a servant of the Amalekites. The Amalekites represent our flesh. He was a 
servant of the lust of the flesh. He was ready to die. He had three days without bread or water, and he was, his spirit was gone out of him. Sounds like Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And we read in that passage how we were walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. We had our conversation, the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. That was us. Here's a picture of us lost in sin. But this man, he found life. Remember David, when he's walking with the Lord, when you read First and Second Samuel, when he's walking with the Lord, he's a picture of Jesus. He points us to the Savior. And this man found life when he was brought to David. He had bread, was given bread to eat, water to drink, cakes, and, uh, cakes of figs and clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, he revived his spirit and came again to him. He has new life. And then he's in the service of the king at the end of it. In fact, uh, I like it that he won't serve David until he is sure that he is free from his old master. He says, make sure that uh, I, I'll tell you where they are as long as you swear unto me that thou neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master. And uh, C.H. McIntosh writes, how oh, that's a beautiful picture of Romans chapter 6, how we serve righteousness, but it's after we reckon ourselves to be dead to sin. Realize that we are dead to sin, dead to our old master. That's when we start to serve the new master, the Lord Jesus Christ. So anyways, I could have preached a whole sermon on that, but it's uh, <clears throat> just something I couldn't leave out. This Amalekite, or this Egyptian, pointing us to our salvation. But this Egyptian, this servant that was left for dead, this was God's provision for them. This was God bringing them to the place. God had, God, God had promised David that, he would, that he'd recover all. He had promised him that all would go well, but he hadn't said how it would happen, how he would do it. And rather than doing like a miracle, he just had this man left behind. This man left behind without food or water, and he was able to lead him to the place. And it was God that was leading the way. God, he was in the way. The Lord led him to where it all was. And he had God's provision. God directed him right where he needed to be. And so then we see not just his mercy and his provision, but number three, when we encourage ourselves in the Lord, number three, we find his faithfulness. We find his faithfulness. And verse 16, and when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men, which rode upon camels and fled. Just a note here. If David's a picture of Jesus when he helped this Egyptian and saved his life, and you must realize he's also a picture of Jesus when he comes to these Amalekites. And here they are, it's a reminder of the second coming of Christ, eating and drinking, dancing, all these things. No idea about what's to come the next moment. And uh, the question for all of us, are you ready for when Jesus returns? Are you looking for him, anticipating his arrival? For us, that's our deliverance. But for the unsaved, uh, who go through their lives, living as they please, taking no thought, the day is coming when Christ will return. And you've got to be ready. And so David sees God's faithfulness here. God saw his journey through to the end. God kept his promise. First of all, we see that he ruined the Amalekites. He ruined, they ruined the Amalekites. He had an enemy, a very serious problem in front of him. And God removed it. God gave him the victory. And it's the same for us today. We have obstacles. We have giants in our way. We have mountains to face. How do you find the victory? You turn to the Lord. When you encourage yourself in the Lord, he'll give you victory over the enemy. And uh, it's interesting that the Malachites, we said already, they're a picture of our flesh. 
a picture of our flesh that's at enmity with the spirit that lives within us. It's the spirit and the flesh are constantly warring against the, one against the other. How do you get the victory? You turn to the Lord. Encourage yourself in the Lord. And he gives us victory over the flesh. And uh, just like you destroyed the Amalekites for David, he gives us victory over the flesh. Then we see his faithfulness in that they recovered all. They recovered all. You know, <clears throat> God didn't have to tell David that they'd get it all back. You know what I mean? He didn't have to say it. He could have just said, go ahead and you'll you have victory. Go ahead and you'll and you'll be successful. Go ahead and you'll get back your wives or just something specific. But God said, go ahead and you'll recover all. Without fail, you'll get all of it. And now in verses 18 and 19, it's emphasized. That's exactly what happened. They recovered all. It says in verse 18, And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. Now, that word all means all, right? That's all it means. (laughs) All means all, that's all all means. But um, just in case you were wondering, Verse 19 clarifies, and there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. It was all there. Every last son, every last daughter, every last wife, every last possession that was taken away, whatever it was, they had it all. And then some. They had so much and to spare. God was faithful. God had made a promise, and God kept the promise right to the jot and tittle and did even more. And so they found his faithfulness. When we encourage ourselves in the Lord, we find his mercy, his provision, his faithfulness. And then one last thing tonight. When we encourage ourselves in the Lord, we find his likeness. We find his likeness. And that's, I think, what is the most encouraging thing about this chapter is, you know what David's acting like? He's acting like Jesus. In this chapter, we see his Christ likeness. We didn't see it back in chapter 27. We didn't see it back in chapter 29. But now that he's encouraged himself in the Lord, now in this chapter, we've seen all the way through He's acting like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he finds his likeness. And uh, we see it, first of all, in his integrity. His integrity. I find verse 21 and 22 a little discouraging to find out that in David's men, there were wicked men, men of Belial. It says, And David came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, Verse 21, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor, and they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men and men of Belial of those that went with David and said, because they were not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Whoa. (laughs) These men... uh, of Belial, they came back with the spoil, everything that they had lost, and then some. And then they see those that had stopped halfway, and they say, they just give them their wife and their kids, and that's it, get them out of here. And uh, they were men of Belial, mad at their brothers who had to stop. They had no compassion, no concern for them, no care for them. Uh, men of Belial. You know, it's a reminder to me. These are David's men. We saw already that David's men represent, like our picture, they like remind us of the church, of the saved people. And yet this is a reminder then of the tares with the wheat, isn't it? There are men that are following David, but the Bible calls them wicked men, men of Belial. And uh, was David going to be swayed by them? Would he be turned by the men of Belial? No, David had compassion on them. David wasn't influenced by them. He had his integrity. And uh, you see, these men that 
stayed at the Brook Besor. Have you ever thought who made that decision? They said, sorry, David, I'm out. I can't make it any farther. Is that what happened? It doesn't. It says in verse 21, it tells us what happened. It says, and David came to the 100, 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. Seems like to me that David said, listen, guys, I can see you're tired. I can see you're having a hard time. You guys need to stay here. He made them stay at the brook Besor. They would have kept going, but David made them stay there. And uh, it's, when he comes to them and he saluted them, it's the idea that he checked in on them. How are you doing? Are you, are, are you doing okay? He's showing compassion for them. And uh, he said, that we're not going to just take all this stuff and not share with these guys. These guys are in our army too. These are our soldiers too. And uh, he made it a statute in Israel that they who stay by the stuff, they also get part of the spoil. Because after all, they had to have had 200 men stay behind when they left to go with the Philistines. Don't you think things might have turned out a little differently? <laughs> Wouldn't have maybe had the, the Amalekites come and take their things. So they shared the spoil. And it's a reminder of the truth for us as Christians, as soldiers of Christ, that we share in our victories. We share the spoil. We rejoice with them that rejoice. We also weep with them that weep. But we're together in our battles. We're together in the Lord's army. And uh, like our Savior, we need to have, make righteous decisions, be in, with integrity to, uh, to share with others. But also we see his generosity. We find Christ's likeness in David's integrity, but also his generosity. He made sure these men got their share. But do you notice in verse 20, you say, well, David obviously got his share. Look what he did. And David took all the flocks and the herds, which they drave before those other cattle, and said, this is David's spoil. Well, so David made sure he got his cut, didn't he? Well, I mean, if he did, I wouldn't say anything against whatever he decided there, but I believe this is what he did with it in verse 26. And when David came to Ziklag, he sent of the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. He gave it to people in Bethel and to Ramoth and Aroer and all these places in Judah. He sent the spoil to them. He shared it. He spread it all around. And yes, I do know Bethel's not in Judah and Ramoth's not in Judah. Most of them are in Judah, though, I'm sure. But <laughs> all these different places. But he spread it around. He was generous. And uh, he shared the bounty that God had given him. Basically, everywhere he used to haunt. Um, <clears throat> that means the different places he'd hide from Saul. All these people that were around those places, he gave them presents uh, for not having told on him, not having for being his friends. And uh, he was a giver. And uh, it reminds us of Christ. He led captivity captive. He rescued the, that which was taken captive and gave gifts unto men. And uh, God is a giver. He's given to us. And someone said, you're never more like God than when you give. Because God is a giver. And so when you, how do you become a giver? Well, it starts by when you encourage yourself in the Lord. David encouraged himself in the Lord. He found his mercy, found his provision, found his faithfulness, found his likeness. What are you facing? What's the trouble? What's the trial? Whatever it is, God is able. Look to the Lord. Encourage yourself in him. Vance Havner told the story about an elderly lady who was greatly disturbed by many troubles. They were real and imaginary. Finally, someone told her, we've done all we can do for you. You're just going to have to trust God for the rest. And a look of absolute despair spread over her face when she replied, oh dear, has it come to that? It always comes to that, Vance Havner said. So we might as well begin with that. David in chapter 30, that has come to that. 
He should have just been there the whole time. Chapter 27, that's where we should have read, he encouraged himself in the Lord. And uh, the good news is, even in chapter 30, when he finally did, God was there for him, and God met his needs. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for the time you've had in your word tonight. I pray that you help us, Lord, to encourage ourselves in you. And uh, thank you, Lord, that you are faithful and that you are merciful and that you provide for us and meet our needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.